Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Welcome back to the Deer University podcast. I am delighted today to be uh, sharing the screen and uh, I guess the microphone for those listening uh, with Steve Damaris, Luke Resop, and Natasha Ellison. And today we're going to be talking about some information and data that Natasha presented at the most recent Southeastern Deer Study Group meeting. And uh, we think it's fascinating. And we know that it got a lot of attention from the audience. So we certainly wanted to, to take this opportunity and share those data and those findings, which are certainly interesting, but they're also going to raise a lot more questions. So I know it's going to generate a lot of thought and it's going to generate a lot of work for us. So, but, but we wanted to go ahead and get this information out and uh, start thinking about it and talking about it. Uh, but before we get into the data, uh, Steve, welcome. I think from the last episode, you might be now known as the bull kudu. So uh, <laughs> I had several people email me uh, photos of a kudu. As, as as opposed to kudos. <clears throat> so, um, how you doing, Steve? I'm doing pretty wonderful, thank you. Pretty wonderful. Yes, I'm, I'm, and I'm not in Africa today. I'm not a kudu. Okay. Well, good. Good. Uh, full disclosure: I had a fantastic venison lunch today. I had uh, I had scapula. But Luke, it was not scapula stew, it was scapula barbacoa. So it is that same reduction of taking the entire scapula and slow cooking it and all of the, the stuff that we typically cut off as connective tissue renders into this delicious, gelatinous, flavor bomb stuff that, that is absolutely delicious. <clears throat> So if you see me nodding off, Steve, you can knock on my door or something and, and wake me up. But it's just because I had a big belly, belly full of venison. You are a foodie extreme and, and su supreme, foodie supreme. Uh, my venture into venison world this past weekend was just making venison burgers. Uh, Nothing wrong with that. I I'm love a, me a gourmet venison burger. It's one of my favorites. I'm a nuts and bolts guy. I grind. I do a lot of grinding and a lot of a lot of burger. Yeah. Well, Luke, I know you have been uh, traveling a whole bunch here recently with your your PhD project. How are things in your world? Things are going great. Couldn't ask for rocking anything and better. rolling. Rock and rolling. We are. Um, staring down the barrel of warm season food plot planting, and I will be starting that at our southernmost study sites this weekend. Fantastic. Okay, well, Natasha, we are glad to have you back again. And uh, Natasha, as a reminder, is a postdoctoral associate, so she's a, a research associate. Uh, she's a, a analytics expert. She is a mathematician. She is a biomathematician. She is delving now into movement ecology and taking it to a level of sophistication that is very difficult for me to comprehend. And I certainly can't comprehend the math. So I just have to trust her when she says, this is the answer. I believe her because I can't, I can't challenge her on that. But Natasha, if, uh, for those that are watching on YouTube, if you want to share your screen and uh, we will start talking about your analysis and your findings and start going through that. I will do. Thank you, Bronson. That, uh, I will talk about the visual that I've put up in a minute. Um, but thank you very much for the introduction. That's right. I basically use any kind of mathematics and statistics to look at animal movement. So since I've joined the Deer Lab, 
we've focused on this data set that we introduced and probably you've introduced a few times actually on the podcast, but we also spoke about last week where uh, Luke spoke about his work with bedding sites. So we estimated where the books uh, are bedding. And here I'm going to start again with this same data set where I'll introduce it and then we'll talk about some of the results that we're finding at the moment. And I think you've mentioned this already and we mentioned it a lot in the last podcast, which is that this is really preliminary results. These are things we've done over a few weeks, um, things that we've known for a few years and things we've just started to look at, but we have a lot more to do. So it's really good that we're getting this data out there and getting everybody's questions. Um, and I've taken a look at a few from the last podcast, so it's giving us loads more ideas, I hope. Um, so to start out with the data set, it was taken by over a few properties just north of Jackson in Mississippi, which we can see on the map. And it was an area of about uh, 50,000 acres of land where we collared around 60 books over the seasons uh, 2017 and 2018. So these were throughout the years, but we had um, more fixes, so more locations for the books coming in in the rut and hunting season. So every 15 minutes, we knew where these books were, and that was around 60 of them. But we also knew a few more things about this area on the landscape. We knew where almost 500 food plots were. We also knew where quite a few feeders were, 90 of them. And we also knew where around 900 stands were throughout these properties. So we know loads about the landscape, not just where our books were throughout the hunting seasons. Um, we also knew when the stands were hunted. We know about the weather. In particular, something people find really interesting is that we knew about the wind speed and direction. And as we spoke about in the last podcast, we also know or have an estimate of where these books were bedding. So we know loads and loads of things about this data. And we're just beginning to touch now on different um, aspects of the movement. And today we're going to focus more on food plots. So when are the books visiting food plots? Why are they visiting food plots? Which are the most commonly visited food plots? Um, and associating that with all the different parts of the landscape at the end too. Um, does anyone else have anything else to add on our data set that I've not mentioned? Well, did you mention that we have about a million location estimates from, from these books? I did not, no. We have a pile of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a huge data set. And... As someone who's worked with a lot of different animal movement data sets and a lot of different species, this is an absolutely huge one that took so much work. And it's not only really key that we know where all these animals were throughout this time, but knowing things about food plots and stands that we know are really big drivers of deer movement is, is really amazing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end and why that's so helpful to us. So the first thing we were really interested in was when are the books visiting the food plots and how how many times are the, are the books generally visiting food plots particularly when we look at the rut so for those people who are watching on youtube then i'm showing up a visual here which i'll talk through so for this particular analysis we were looking at september to february so before the rut starts and throughout the rut and how many food plots were visited per day by our books on average so we averaged over all of our books um, at each part of the rut here, well, actually for each day over the through September to February, and we looked at how many visits were happening per day to a food plot. So we see that through September to November, just before the rut starts, books are visiting about one food plot a day. But as the, the rut begins and as it progresses through the rut, the books are visiting around two, two and a half food plots a day. So these in food plot visits are increasing, more are being visited throughout the rut. But what's even more interesting is when we look at how much time was spent in these food plots, and we look again from September to February, we see that there was much more time spent within food plots. So September, for example, books are spending on average around two hours in food plots and this decreases to when we start the rut and books are spending less than an hour on average in December, January um, within these food plots. 
So what we can see from, from our huge data set of all these books is that in general, they're moving around, visiting more food plots within the rut, but actually spending a lot less time, which we suspect is due to uh, the books chasing does and um, increasing their chances of uh, encountering a doe throughout this rut season. Yeah, I, I think this is really interesting. And Natasha, if you remember when we first looked at uh, at those data, we were looking at, at the graph on the left, which is just the, the visits per day. And uh, to me, it was kind of counterintuitive in that why are they spending uh, so much time in those food plots during the rut as opposed to, to pre-rut? And uh, so that was where we got the idea. We need to add in an element of time because a visitation to a food plot, it could literally just be from a, uh, a social aspect. It could just be a buck going to a food plot, seeing if there are any does there, heat checking any does that are there and just moving on. You know, we also know that that is the time of year that they are losing weight. We know from previous analyses, they are not spending as much time eating, hence why most bucks, at least three and a half or older, are losing 20% of their body weight over this period. So when we looked at that, we're like, that really doesn't add up. Why are they spending so much time there when we know they're not consuming a lot of food? So then when we added in the hours that they were actually in each of these food plots, it became very clear. They're spending a lot of time eating in September and October. And then as we see the breeding season season is beginning and the rut is beginning, uh, they're not spending, well, they're spending on average less than an hour. And that less than an hour for that time of year for the peak of the rut is um, that spread over about one and a half to two food plots. So very little time they're spending there. But then, Steve, we know from post-rut recovery, there is a, a shift in their, their biological needs. They're shifting from uh, rut as being the primary interest and breeding being the primary interest to trying to regain some body weight. So that is why we see that big uptick there at the end of the rut to where they are not only visiting those food plots a lot per day, they're also spending more time in those food plots per day. So is it really a cool way? To, I think I'm very biased, but I think it was a cool way to look at uh, the social aspect of this, as well as the, the ecological and biological aspect of this about them uh, trying to take in more calories and, and rebuild their bodies. Mm -hmm. And another little context here for our, particularly our Southern uh, listeners. Uh, we have, observations in food plots in September. Well, if you're in the South, you don't have food plots, cool season food plots in September. These Our study area had warm season food plots and cool season food plots. So that's why they're, they're doing stuff in food plots in September. Uh, they did exist and, and predominantly uh, our warm season, a lot of the landowners planted uh, deer vetch. And come September, it was really in great shape uh, generally, and uh, it could provide adequate, wonderful food, but also it was high enough that uh, you could hide out in it. You could literally bed in it. So that might explain some of that duration that they're spending in the in the food plots in September. And uh, also, you know, everybody knows they spend more time in the woods in October, and uh, deer get a little spooky, spooked by the the increased activity, and so probably they're spending less time in them in October than than they were in September. Well, Steve, that, that's a good point re regarding the deer vetch and specific to that study site or that whole area. Very fertile uh, relative to the number of acres of food plots and agriculture. There's a, there was a lot of food. So um, in some places, a warm season food plot of deer vetch is not going to turn into cover because the deer are not going to allow it to turn into cover. Yeah. But, but in this place, that they, they could do that. But so that is one explanation and we can't disentangle this. So they could be spending some time there using it as cover. But also we're getting to the end of the late summer nutritional bottleneck for deer in the South. Mm 
And September is still um, uh, really difficult for deer to find really high quality food on the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I can equally see where they're really spending a lot of time in September in those food plots because that's some of the highest quality food in the neighborhood. Yep. And it may be worth mentioning here that um, although this is visits per day on average, we also looked at unique visits to food plots. So, so food plots that different food plots that were visited per day. So whether or not this two visits per day on average were unique, different food plots. Yes, in general, they were. So if, you, if you're thinking about when you're hunting um, there in the rut, in general, it's about two different food plots that are visited, not the same one as a general pattern. Just to clarify very quickly for uh, the audience, especially those that are watching, I know we have uh, visits per day here, but that does not, uh, it's not in reference to daytime hours, legal hunting hours. This is for a 24 hour period. Is that correct? So we, we, there are, we will talk about a little bit later how all of this breaks down into day versus night. But just keep in mind when we're talking about these numbers, one visit per day between September and November, and then closer to two visits per day in December to February, that's just for a 24 hour period. And we'll break apart day versus night in a little bit. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Luke. Well, let's move on to talking about um, what kind of food plot sizes were visited by our books. Um, and here, if, you, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm showing a distribution of our food plot sizes. So in a, in a previous slide, and we previously mentioned that we, we know where about 500 food plots were through our study site. And we can have a look at the percentage of those food plots that, that were different sizes. So around 40% of our food plots were between um, one and two acres. And then we get less and less um, food plots as our size increases. So we have a couple of food plots between 10 and 20 acres, a, a few more food plots that were between five and 10 acres. But the majority of our food plots were between zero and one, so, sorry, zero and two acres. So less than two acres, the majority of our food plots with a median of about 1.7 acres. Um, so we wanted to see if, if that was the same when we looked at all of our visits to food plots. Were the deer generally visiting those food plots that were uh, less than two acres that, because that's what we have the most of? But when we have a look at that distribution of visits, so again, this is just 24, the whole 24 hour period for all of our books that we had collars. Um, what is the distribution of the visits? Um, relative to the size. And what we found that the most visited food plots are actually about four acres. So the most commonly visited food plot was about four acres, a few less that are about three and five acres. Um, but actually, and if you're looking at the slides on YouTube, there are only a few visits, about 5% of the visits that were uh, for food plots between zero and one acres. So although with this analysis, there's lots of things we're not considering, like the spatial distribution, how far away each of these um, food plots were. This is a very basic analysis, just throwing it out there, having a look um, at the most visited size. And we found it to be about four acres. This is this is fascinating to me. Um, so when we think about the, so when we look at the graph here on the left, it shows the percentage of food plots and how you know, food plot size is distributed across our study site. We see that the median food plot, like you said, is 1.7 acres. If, and I'm just trying to put this into context for people. If there was no preference, if deer had no preference for food plot size and they were just randomly selecting food plots, regardless of the size of those food plots, we would also see the median of 1.7 acres. It'd be very close to what we see in food plot distribution in the landscape, but that's not what we see at all. We see that deer are clearly selecting for larger food plots preferentially. They're preferring to be foraging in larger food plots. And the way that I interpret this, um, and there could be other things going on here, but the way I interpret this is those really small food plots, one to two acres in a landscape that has relatively high deer density, they get grazed to the ground fairly quickly. 
and there's not a whole lot of forage biomass per mouthful. Think of it that way. There's not a whole lot of forage biomass per mouthful that a deer can get. But when you get into the two, three, four, five, ten acre range, the deer have a harder time suppressing that growth and there's more forage they can get per bite. So in my mind, this is kind of, a, I'm not trying to get too nerdy here, but this is kind of an optimal foraging theory thing. This is how deer are optimizing how much food they can get in their mouth in the least amount of time by visiting food plots that are providing more forage per bite. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, and I agree with, with Luke a hundred percent. Um, and you touched on earlier about the the increasing frequency but lower duration of visits to food plots. I wonder uh, if some of this uh, preference for larger food plots could be a social phenomenon too, is because I'm more likely to see some does out in the big food plot because it's bigger. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree. I, we don't know if that's the answer. But but to me, it is very reasonable that there's a lot of things interacting here. Um, so uh, as Luke mentioned, we've got a we, we've got an area that is providing food, and then we have a, a a good number of deer. The smaller the plot, the easier it's going to be to to browse that down. And so throughout deer season, it is not offering from an optimal foraging perspective. It is not as attractive of a food plot because there's not as much food at that food plot. As such, that could also be affecting uh, the number of does that are using that food plot. C conversely, when we start getting into that four and five acre, so we get away from the deer biology and get more on the agronomy side of it, now we're getting large enough to wear we're having that ideal size relative to sunlight and photosynthesis and minimizing the edge effect. And so we've all been to some of these really, really small food plots and nothing against them. I'm all for them. They're great places to hunt. But you can see in some of these quarter acre, for example, food plots, or it may be larger, but they're very thin, is that they're only getting a couple hours of direct sunlight per day because of tree competition and root competition and so forth. So they're never producing the optimal amount of forage. When we get into these three, four, and five acre food plots, they are large enough. Now it's a field. And so now yeah. they're getting sunlight for four, five, six, maybe plus hours a day. And so it is, it's producing a lot more food. So optimal foraging perspective, there's more food per acre as such, more deer are going to use it. As a result, it's a better spot on the landscape socially for a buck to visit. And, and what I think is equally as fascinating is diminishing returns. So then we might say, well, five acres ought to be better. Six, seven, ten acres ought to be even better. But, but that is not what the data tell us whatsoever. It rapidly falls off after about that four or five acre mark. So something to think about in terms of allocating uh, your effort, your money, et cetera, on the landscape from what we are seeing right here. If, uh, if I have money, seed, bulldozer, et cetera, to where I'm going to go out on my landscape and create food plots and I've got enough uh, money to allocate to grow 10 acres worth of food plot, you, you might want to consider, instead of doing one 10 acre food plot, do two five acre food plots. That might help you on average see more deer and get more usage that way. That's how I interpret it anyway. That's open to for interpretation. Yep, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, and we might throw out a quick little terminology thing here. We're, we're talking about medians. And most people have heard of average or mean. Uh, median is, is another measure of central tendency, they call it. And it just it's we chose it here because uh, when you have a few really large somethings mixed in with a bunch, of, a whole bunch of smaller somethings that those few really large values tend to shift the mean, you know, it's, it's based on the distribution and People like uh, Dr. Ellison over there that are mathematicians, they, they get into uh, 
understanding that far better than I do. But median is a, a what we chose to represent here as a measure of central tendency. You could kind of think of it as an average, but it's not quite the same. Yeah, it's the same way when when people talk about income in an area for people paychecks. Yeah, you know they use median because if Jeff Bezos moves into the neighborhood and he's worth. <laughs> Ten billion dollars. It really affects the mean. Yeah, that's why we use median as a better representation of the of the distribution of incomes. <clears throat> so similar here, there were a couple uh, food plots that were beyond typical food plot size. They were more agricultural field size, and and Natasha didn't want that to to bias this estimate too much. So that's why she used the median. I want to spend. I want to spend a, one more minute nerding out on this because I think it's. This is just so fascinating to me. Um, and we talked about potential mechanisms here, right? There's the amount of food provided in these larger food plots. There's the social aspect to all of this, but just to give people another little way to think about this, and I'm probably oversimplifying this a little bit, but when we look at the availability of food plots of a certain acreage and the use of those food plots, um, we can kind of calculate how deer are using them relative to what's available. So if we look at a one acre food plot, deer are only using one acre food plots a third as much as they're available, which essentially indicates that not that deer are avoiding those, but they're not using them nearly as much as they're available. When we move into that four acre food plot size, we see that deer are using them nine times as much as they're available. So deer are really selecting for this, you know, four acre food plot size. When we move into the 10 acre food plot, they're using those seven times as much as they're available. But we see that, you know, greatest ratio of use to availability right at that four acre size. So that's essentially what these graphs are showing. I'm just trying to explain it in a different way. Natasha, can you check his math on that? Yes, please. Yes, do. yes. Um, but Luke makes a really good point um, about availability. So another another thing I did look at, which we're not showing here, is is individual availability. So what was available to each of the the books in their general home range, the general area that each of the books were using, what was available to them in terms of home, uh, food plot size. And what were they using? What kind of sizes were they using on an individual level? And looking at each of those books individually, we do still see that they tend to be using food plots around two acres bigger than the most commonly available on average, using this thing called the median, as Steve mentioned. Another point we haven't made is that this data is between September and February again, so this this season around the rut, um, when when we know a lot more about our books because we had more data coming in around that season, but also that this doesn't really change through all of that rut season. Actually, in September October, um, the most commonly preferred food plot size on average was about five acres, and then in November December January it was about four acres. So it really doesn't change so much that preference. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Four to five acre food plots is the way to go. Uh huh. So what have we looked at so far? We've looked at the amount visited and also the sizes. Um, my favorite part of this analysis is coming next, which is when we looked at the time of day that food plots were visited. Um, so I'm going to start actually just, just with one part of the data set. So this is October. So in both the years in October, we looked at the um, amount of visits that happened at each part of the day. So let me talk you through this graph that I'm showing. And if you're listening to the podcast, I'll uh, try and give as much information as I can. So we were particularly interested in what happened in the legal shooting hours and the illegal shooting hours throughout the uh, what would be the hunting season. So um, from noon to sunset plus 30 minutes and then from sunset plus 30 minutes to midnight. And on the, the graph here, I've colored the legal shooting hours, if you like, in green and the illegal in blue. And what we can see is that there is way more visits in these illegal shooting hours from sunset plus 30 minutes until midnight. The, dirt, the deer in October, the books in October, prefer to visit food plots after that sunset plus 30 minutes. 
Um, in fact, in the the uh, the daytime, if you like, from noon until sunset plus 30 minutes, about 30 percent of the food plot visits happen then. Um, and we can look at that on a, on a different kind of scale where we look from midnight. So we'll go over the night time from midnight until noon. And then we have that boundary from sunrise minus 30 minutes. So we've got the, the different part after midnight of the illegal shooting hours, if you like. And again, we see that most of the visits, around 70% of the visits happen in this illegal shooting hours in the night time. So essentially, um, in the night time is when the books in October are preferring to visit our food plots. Now I can compare that to all the data that we have from December. So if you're watching online, I'm showing the same graphs, but in December, where we see a shift to only 20% of the visits to food plots happening in the legal shooting hours. So in both cases, from noon until midnight, where we look at that boundary at sunset and from midnight until noon, where we also have that boundary at sunrise, 80 percent of our visits are happening in the nighttime. And the really key part about this is what's happening at that boundary. So when we're shifting between being allowed to shoot deer, if we're in the, the hunting season and not being allowed. So that boundary at sunset or that boundary at sunrise it appears that the deer are learning um, to, to not visit food plots when we have legal shooting hours. So we see a big shift. If we just look at these uh, graphs at the top, if you're watching on YouTube, we can see that the change of visits at sunset and sunrise doesn't change so much. There's still about the same amount of deer visiting just before sunset and just after sunrise. Whereas we're in, when we go into December, when we have our books starting to learn when, when there's a possibility of hunters on the landscape and starting to understand what's going on, uh, we see a big shift that deer are really not visiting as much um, just before sunset and just after sunrise, but they're visiting a whole lot more before we see light and before light ends. So basically, they're learning here not to visit the food plots when there's going to be hunters on the stand <laughs> or on the landscape in general. Yeah, and I so I'll take I'll take the first stab at explaining this, and then y'all correct me and make it sound better. Um, the most plausible explanation for this in my mind. So like it, this really helps to look at these graphs that Natasha has made because they really scream that there's something obvious going on here. The only, the, I think the most plausible way to explain this, why deer from October to December are drastically changing their visitation of food plots right around that sunset sunrise time frame is that they're running into hunters in food plots. They hunters are educating deer in food plots and deer are learning that if I don't want to run into hunters, I don't visit food plots during hunting hours. That's the simplest way in my mind to explain this. So what do you do with that? Quit educating deer in food plots that you're there. You know, it, this, this has all to do with more of the strategy of stand placement and how you're accessing your stand and how your stand is visually obstructed from the food plot and how much noise you're making when you're getting into your stand and wind direction getting into your stand and all of those things. This is simply, in my mind, deer are running into hunters in food plots during hunting hours and they're learning to do it less. And I actually think that point brings us back to... Um the the conclusion that we had that deer are visiting around two different food plots in the rut. So why not figure out where those two food plots are if you're after a particular deer and place your hunting stand between those food plots, knowing that, that that's potentially happening and that you're having an effect on their movement um, and having them uh, stopping them from visiting and legal shooting hours uh, as the season progresses. Listen to Natasha there. She's got some <laughs> buck hunting strategy she's throwing out there. Oh, I'm no, learning Luke, from the best. <laughs> Luke, I, I, I completely agree. Um, the the most simple explanation here, and, and again, this is representing uh, a couple years and a lot of data and hundreds and hundreds of food plots. So the the signal here in terms of the signal from the data that Natasha is presenting is really, really strong. 
and it's really clear. And the best explanation is, is yeah, I completely agree, Luke, is hunting pressure on food plots. And it's not just that you're hunting, it's not just your presence, you're also harvesting on these food plots. If you're harvesting on these food plots, you're retrieving a dead deer off of those food plots. And so, yeah, when you go from October to December, you got a couple months of that hunter behavior, deer are figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And they are obviously, from this data, changing their behavior. Um, so yeah, to, to me, it's crystal clear that the, the one thing that's the, the data are still crystal clear with what I'm about to say, but I do not have the best explanation is in October. To me, it is really interesting that those spikes of usage at noon. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that is just an artifact of the, uh, the signal of hunting pressure on those areas hasn't built up enough. And so deer are just doing their normal sun up and sun down movement bouts for feeding. And because they haven't detected a lot of pressure yet on those food plots, they're also grabbing them uh, a little snack around mm -hmm. lunchtime. One thing we could do with that, Natasha, is look at um, in the future, what is the average feeding bout time? during that 11 a.m. to 1 p.m.? Is it just a short little visit? Or are they also spending, you know, an hour or more at those noontime visits? That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. I think this is a real phenomenon that we've documented here. I've, I personally have walked in, and I think most people walk in in an after, for a, you get, think you're getting in early, and dang, there's already deer out in the, in the plot. And I think this is real. Deer visit plots during the middle of the day. They have their crepuscular patterns, but then they're also doing more during the night in between sunset and sunrise, and they're doing some stuff midday. Uh, go out and don't. I mean, a classic southern hunting approach is you go out and hunt three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon, and we get lazy, and the deer figure that out. And, heck, I'm going to go visit that food plot that – that four acre food plot with an abundant resources and, and plenty of does in it. And I'm going to do that in the middle of the day. There's almost as much, uh, there's almost like, especially looking at this October graph, there is basically as much, uh, visitation to food plots at noon and 1 PM as there is right at sunset, which is just, I mean, or, or just at, right at sunrise also, which is uh, fascinating to me. And when you look at the lowest uh, visitation frequency, when when deer, when deer bucks are using food plots the least, it's right at, I don't know, if, let's say if sunset's at 6 p.m. and noon's at noon, then it's right at 3 p.m., right? Which is, I'm, I would wager a hefty amount of money that if you looked at when hunters on average were getting to their stands, it would line up very well with when deer food plot usage is at a minimum. Yep. And the same with the, the morning when they're not using them in the morning, it's because hunters are getting out of their stands then. Yep. I mean, we, we, we shoot ourselves in the foot figuratively so many times when we deer hunt because we don't try to outsmart the deer we expect the deer to be stupid and we're gonna because we we have something that we bought somewhere or we heard somewhere uh we're just gonna we got some new boots uh, oh that's gonna help me kill something i'm just gonna go and do something that's you know doesn't make sense if you're you know these these critters we're trying to kill them and they know that and they're they've existed for eons as prey they figure out how to avoid being killed Every prey species that's been looked at in North America, Europe, Africa, they know how to do it. That's why they still exist. Yep, good good point. I guess we can just wrap up here by saying, too, and Natasha alluded to this earlier, I, we all have, uh, what's one of the best things you could do to minimize the effect that we're seeing here is to still use the food plot 
as a feature on the landscape and as a as a magnet and concentration point for deer movement and buck movement, but back off of the food plot. And like Natasha alluded to, if you have two of these big kind of anchor point food plots on your property, um, figure out how to situate yourself in between those and a movement corridor, maybe a little cover corridor that connects those. For habitat management, that might be a great thing to do is to go out and create a cover corridor that is linking those food plots together. And that would be perfect way for a bow hunter to set up on on f- for that strategy. So you're not hunting the food plot directly on it, but you're still hunting the food plot. You're still using it to your advantage. That's a wonderful idea. That reminds me of conversations we've had recently about trying to understand deer, deer paths through through the landscape. And if you're creating your own deer path there, that that is very cool. Um, I had a question for you guys, actually, based on this. I can see, so we can see this learning behavior of the deer from October to December at this sunset and sunrise time. But as we thought about the um, in, the increased visits around noon, potentially all through the year, do you think this is a learned behavior that's remembered from year to year that it's reasonably safe to visit food plots around noon? Luke, we're waiting. <laughs> I have nothing to say here. <laughs> I, I think it's entirely possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really do. So if there is this uh, pattern that is occurring on a property for, say, 20 years, the same fields have been planted, not the, the way they're doing it, uh, the, the seed they're using, the crop they're growing may be different, but essentially... People have been hunting these same food plots for a decade or two. Absolutely. I see where that could be possible, where that is going to be a learned behavior from doe to offspring, you know, generation after generation. So I don't know if that's happening, but I could, I think it's a plausible argument. Yeah, I think so too. I think that like when you think about why deer are most active when they're active, you know, we all know that deer are crepuscular, meaning that generally speaking they're most active at dawn and dusk and there's kind of you know two peaks in their movement activity throughout the day and they've got a lot of physiological adaptations to being most active at that time of day for example the way that their eyes are um engineered is it's uh adapted them to deal with the light conditions and the wavelengths at low light conditions at dawn and dusk now that's the, you know, we talk about nurture versus nature. That's the nature side of things. They're uh, hardwired physiology. But I think the nurture side of things is just as plausible of a mechanism. You know, if a, if a doe runs into hunters at 3 p.m. a lot and at 10 a.m. a lot when hunters are getting out of the stand at 3 p.m. when hunters are getting into the stand, runs into hunters a lot right at dawn and dusk as they're, you know, getting in or out of the stand or whatever, and she's got her fawns with her, her buck fawns. I think that is the nurture side of things. I think they're learning that if I want to survive, that means don't run into people. You know, they view us as a, as a predator, don't run into people. And the best way to do that is to not be in food plots at 3 PM or sunrise and sunset. Just think too of, of the sounds that a deer could hear and a pattern they could develop because when even I, that I don't have good eyesight, I don't have good hearing, I certainly can't smell like a deer, and and I don't have hair either. But when you can when you can listen, so let me back up. If you were to be the person, Steve, and you were to say, I'm going to go hunt today, I'm going to get on the stand at noon. In most situations, starting at two o'clock or three o'clock, you're going to be able to hear hunter activity on that property. You're going to hear vehicles. You're going to hear doors slam. You're going to hear ATVs. You're going to hear all of this movement there about on the property. So why can't a deer associate those sounds and knowing that there's about to be hunters going to that stand that, that uh, they're going to be able to detect? 
and establish a pattern. When they start hearing all the buzz going around on the hunting property, they go to cover and get off the plot. Absolutely. I, I think you right on target. All right. Well, I think this is uh, given us a whole load of ideas to think about. Next thing we were thinking of looking at with this data, and again, this is really preliminary, but I think it's still important, was l looking at the usage of food plots with reference to bedding sites. So in the previous podcast, Luke spoke a lot about our estimated bedding sites and things that we know about that. But we were really interested in looking at those afternoon visits to food plots. So when books are moving out of their bedding areas in the afternoon and moving to the first food plot that they visit. So that's any food plot visited between waking up from the bedding site to midnight even. We looked at all of those cases and just had a look at the distance from that bedding site to the food plot in yards. And what we've got plotted up here um, is distances which go from any, anything between zero to a thousand yards and um, the percentage of bedding locations that was within that distance. And what we found was that um, a bedding site of a distance of about 100 to 200 yards was most common. So those bedding sites, uh, so basically that books were bedding around 100 to 200 yards away from the food plots that they were choosing to visit when they woke up. So I think this is really important, again, with people hunting food plots in those evening times and trying to get those, maybe even a particular book that they know is visiting, how far away are they bedding? Um, we think around 100 to 200 yards. Yeah, and, and one thing I know I was concerned about, Natasha, when we first were looking at these data, um, and some people may be looking at this on YouTube and thinking the same thing, was that based on our landscape and where the study was, is it just random chance that the most common distance from cover to food plot was 100 to 200 yards? And so I know you went behind the scenes and looked at all of the available combinations and that that was not a concern, that there was uh, far more opportunity for deer to bed further than one to 200 yards away from a plot, that what we're seeing here, we think anyway, is showing a preference by them to yes. be to one to 200 yards away. And again, I looked at that with individual books as well, is looking at their home range, that the places that they go most often, do they not have the opportunity to bed further away? But they certainly did. Yeah. So they are, it seems to us that they are choosing those distances. Can you help me, help me understand this? So bucks have the opportunity to bed farther away. For example, like a buck could choose a spot in the landscape that's 1200 yards away from a food plot. That makes, you know, most bucks I'm sure could go find somewhere in their home range. that's really far from all the food plots, but what, um, I'm trying to remember what the, if you just dropped a random point on the landscape, you dropped a thousand random points in the landscape, what is the average distance from that point to the nearest food plot? What was that? Yeah, we looked at that. It was I can't remember what it was now, but it was lo it was larger. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I asked Natasha that exact same question <laughs> regarding some random points mm -hmm. and the distance from food plots. And yeah, there there was a big difference between the average distance from those random points and then what we're seeing here with where the bucks were bedded. Hmm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess one way I interpret this, um, I'll, I'll throw this out there for constructive criticism. I may be wrong is these data to me say that there is a tendency or a preference for bucks, and remember these this is buck data, not doe data, that these bucks on average want to be a couple hundred yards away from the food plot of choice for that evening feeding bout. So this is just those afternoon movement bouts from the afternoon bed to where they are, are foraging uh, for that, that first feeding bout. It appears that they want to be a couple hundred yards away. 
So what do you do if you're on a landscape where there is no cover? Like if you were to put a uh, put the food plot on a map on Hunt Stand or Onyx or Google Earth or whatever, and you did a buffer for 200 yards around that food plot, and at least from what you can see, there's no good deer bedding cover. Luke, what, what can you do to, to remedy that? Well, I think... I think there's a lot of things you can do to remedy that, you know, starting with, you know, just the common sunlight management stuff we talk about, creating really good structure in the understory, vertical screening cover, etc. cetera. Um, but my question here is, like, we don't know what the, and I know we've looked at this with some previous studies before, but not in specific reference to bedding sites in relation to food plots. Like, we don't know that there wasn't, or there was good cover at these chosen sites relative to food plots, right? There might have been very poor cover and deer didn't care because they wanted to be 200 yards away from a food plot. Or they might have been, it might just so happen that the average distance of good cover to a food plot is 200 yards. So it's kind of hard for me to tease that apart and figure out if the cover is more important or the distance is more important. I'm inclined to think that the cover is more important. Um, but that's, I don't know, it's a little, the waters are a little muddy there for me, I think. Uh, I, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Uh, I guess where I was going with this was um, if there was something proactive that you could do. So like you said, Luke, you, you're exactly right. Maybe this deer just wants to be, this buck just wants to be 250 yards away. Uh, that's where he plopped down to chew his cud, and that's going to be his afternoon bed. Um but you could proactively go out and make sure that paired with every one of these food plots within 200 yards, there was some good cover. Mm -hmm. So that is just something you could do from a manager, manager's perspective to facilitate that. And maybe you take a little error or a little randomness now, Luke, to where, um, yep, it, we're never going to be able to predict where a buck is going to bed with 100% certainty. But I think we all agree we can influence that by providing good cover in the optimal spots. So from a hunting perspective, maybe now because you know where there's a greater likelihood of the bedding cover associated with that food plot, and we were just talking about not sitting on the plot to hunt, but on a pathway to that plot, this might just be a way to, again, help facilitate that and tilt the odds in your favor. But the data are clear here. There are certainly some bucks that, uh, you know, the numbers Natasha has here, some of these bucks are moving over a thousand yards, over a thousand yards. And we don't know why that is. Was there no good cover? Maybe they uh, didn't want to go to the food plot that was maybe 200 yards away. They wanted to go to the food plot that was 1,000 yards away. We don't know. But with the, the numbers, the amount of data that Natasha has plotted here, the, the pattern is pretty clear. And I think what we want to do is focus on a couple of things, combining this slide, this information with the previous about, you know, the ideal food plot size of about four acres and the ideal bedding site two to 300 acres away from that four acre food plot. And, and with the understanding that there's lots of variation in individual circumstances that it's not always going to work. But if you build that kind of a system on your property, I think it's going to help you create and then thus pattern buck movements better than if you just don't consider these things. I think that that is a very reasonable and an effective approach as long as you pair it with uh, hunting in a really smart way, either on the food plot or between cover and the food plot. But so I think that's on kind of one end of the spectrum. I think the other end of the spectrum is just having you know, 95% of the property surrounding a food plot or just, you know, everything that's not a food plot has really high quality cover, right? I think that's an option, but doing it that way, it's a lot harder to predict deer movements to your food plots because they can really go anywhere and be in concealed cover. So I think in, 
in that scenario, you, I guess you'd have to rely more on hunting the food plots. You just have to be really smart about how you do it because of what we talked about earlier. You cannot be, you cannot let deer know that you're hunting that food plot. And if you're making noise, talking loudly, UTVs that they're not used to running around, you know, slamming doors, all that kind of stuff. That's how you get deer to avoid food plots when you're there. So I think there are a couple of different uh, ways to skin that cat. And I think the, the uh, key part to all of them is being able to predict where these bucks want to be and not let them be able to predict where you're going to be. I think that's a good point. Uh, part to say that there is so much information that isn't in this graph for example like these these food plots being visited a thousand yards away what is that because they're encountering hunters is that because they're encountering other books or they they smell a doe elsewhere there's just so much in this also the the big thing that we talked about um a couple of minutes ago is cover this landscape is is reasonably uniform um in terms of cover it's only one part of mississippi but we still don't know about those individual food plots and the cover around them. There's just so much that goes into this that I could sit here for a month and analyze this data, this exact, just, just looking at these distances based on all of these things. And we know a lot more um, and there's a lot more to, to look at with this. But I think that this is a good, a good like scope into it. Just, just one, one good view that we can still use um, as a starting point. So I, I know we prefaced this whole talk, uh, and I think the last podcast we did, we tried to preface this too. There is so much more to look at here. So much more. I mean, we've got over a million GPS points to analyze and hundreds of food plots. And I mean, just there's so much to do here, dozens and dozens of bucks. Um, and I think one thing that would be interesting to look at with this analysis in particular is to very simply break this up by month or rut phase or whatever, because I would, I would assume maybe incorrectly that in the earlier portion of, let's say September, for example, way, you know, two and a half, three months before the rut, um, when deer are on more of a food cover, food cover pattern, I would expect them to be bedding closer to food plots because that is what's, you know, occupying a lot of their time, food cover, food cover. Now, when we, if we lump all the data together from September through February and we get to, you know, December when they're spending the least number of hours in a food plot based on the graph we looked at a while ago, then it's plausible that a deer gets up out of his bed in the afternoon and he goes and he spends the next four hours searching for a doe. And after he finds a doe, he ends up in the food plot that she was closest to. So now that maybe is where you get some of these 1,000, 1,200 yard distance from bedding site to food plots coming in. So I think it, it might clean it up a little bit if we broke this apart by season or rut phase or whatever, but it doesn't diminish the point that 200 yards, 100 to 200 yards is, you know, what screams at us in this data. So I, yeah, that, I actually did look at it by rut. Um, it may have been, I think I actually looked at it by month and there was, there was very little change, first of all, in the shape of the distribution, but also in the, the average distance was, was really differing by only maybe, maybe 10 yards. So, but that of course was only September to February, well, September to January. So we didn't look at the rest of the year yet. So that could show a difference when the, you know, the, the uh, behavioral, the behavioral needs are different, you know, way out of the rut season. Yeah. And one of the things we haven't touched on yet, and that we will in, in the future is we know which stands were hunted in on given days. So we'll be able to tease that in and, and consider, you know, food plot use relative to the stands that are on those food plots. Have they been hunted in the last week? Have they been hunted more than once? You know, so we'll be able to continue tweaking all this massive database that we have that Luke was talking about a minute ago. Uh, and, and subsequent podcasts, we'll, we'll be able to tweak our recommendations even further. And, and I'd love to be able to come up with a recommended uh, visitation rate for getting in stands. Avoid more than this frequency of stand use. Absolutely. Uh, that actually brings 
brings us on to the the last part of the analysis, which is something that I'm still working on, um, and is my it's really where my skill set is. It's my favorite part of looking at like collared animals and how they're moving around. Um, and to start that off, we'll look more closely at the data that we have. So we talked about the fact that we have 60 books collared and throughout the uh, hunting season and just before we have 15 minute fixes. So we know the location of every collared book every 15 minutes. And if we plot this out as a journey, so I don't know if YouTube viewers can see my cursor or not, but we have a starting point at some time for each of our books and we draw a path from 15 minutes to 15 minutes to 15 minutes. So we start at 6 p.m., 6.15, 6.30, 6.45. We have this path, this progression, and we consider each of these movements. So these changes in location every 15 minutes. And we look at what happened at the past and we look at what happens in the future compared to things like our food plots, maybe our bedding sites, maybe our hunted stands. We have lots of different variables that we can look at. This is the analysis that's ongoing now. And we already have some um, some really nice results for this, but we're still working on it. And again, this data set's from 2017, 2018, but we just have so much more to look at and so much more to learn. So I'll, I'll show you now how I do this kind of analysis and also uh, what we've learned so far. So really what we look at is if we just take a location of one of our books and we look at that movement change, that location change from one place to the next over that 15 minute period, we look at lots of different things like the change, maybe the change in the distance to a food plot or the change of the distance to a feeder or the change perhaps in, in something like the uh, topography. We've got so many different variables to put into this. Um, and when we look at those location changes, so we, we, we look at one particular site like this, but then we look at those location changes as a series and we start to look at patterns. So we look at our data. We have loads of different mathematical tools to do this, but we look at patterns throughout the data. What do the deer prefer to move towards? What do they prefer to move away from? And we can also compare, for example, this movement here, if you're looking at the screen, this movement in green, we can compare that movement. If we know enough about the landscape, we can compare what's going on around that location. How many stands are there? Are those stands being hunted? What kind of food plots are around that area? If we compare those to places that that deer could have visited, but chose not to. So for every single movement we have, for every single book that we have collared, we look at those places they've chosen to go to, and we can compare them to places that they didn't choose in that time period. And we also know about what's going on in those places they didn't choose, how many stands were there, how many food plots were there, what's the change in topography, what's the change um, maybe even in temperature or over long scales. But when we compare the patterns in our data throughout all of our population, we start to see some really key things happening. And we actually found so far that our books are way more likely to move to places with a high density of feeders which is kind of obvious, I guess, with a high density of food plots. And they actually seem to prefer moving to places of larger food plots um, and with a low density of stands. And when those stands are being hunted or when they've been hunted within the, an hour or so um, of our movements taking place, they're way less likely to move to those places. So we're still working on this, but it's such a clear pattern in our data that this is how our books are moving around the landscape and choosing new places to go. Yeah, it's uh, it's rather intuitive <laughs> <laughs> in in terms of uh, yeah, uh, of course we know deer are using food plots and we know they are going to use feeders when they're available. We also, as we've talked about previously, talking about hunting pressure and the the legacy from year in year out or or throughout a season of hunting pressure and those stand locations, uh, deer are learning how to, to navigate the environment. And so they are, they are simultaneously seeking food and avoiding predation, meaning avoiding hunters. So, but it, but it's really cool. Um, it, it's one of those things where it, it shouldn't be a big surprise in what we found, 
but it is very interesting, Natasha, with the way that you're able to look at that and validate all of that with these movement models. And mathematically, it is literally showing the things that they are preferring and avoiding on the landscape. And also, although this seems obvious to some of us, and it is, this is the kind of area where this this complicated math stuff actually is important because when there's things we don't know about the deer, for example, are they preferring to move with a particular distance, uh, sorry, with a particular wind direction, as one example that we're, we're starting to look at recently, um, having all this knowledge within the model can separate out those different things. Um, so when we know that they're definitely moving towards high densities of food plots and we can have that within our kind of analysis and modeling, um, we can then separate that out as, as you know, that they've chosen this location. Is it because of the food plots there? Did they choose that location because there's not food plots in the other direction? It kind of teases that apart and it allows us to look at um, behaviors that we're not so sure about. So having this all in this huge combination of analysis allows us to now test for things that maybe we don't understand. Well, I think that's a great reason to keep listening to the podcast because we're going to be coming up with more analyses in the future. And I mean, one thing I haven't shown on here for for the reason that we're still doing the analyses is we can come out with uh, particular values on these kind of uh, books are more likely to move to these places. We can put percentage values on these. We can say things like books are 20% more likely to move to this location if there's a stand within 100 meters, within 100 yards or something like that. So that's the kind of... Uh, kind of ways we're going to be able to use these these analyses yeah i, I think that's real exciting i i don't know if we can do this or not natasha but it, it it would be cool to figure out what is the what would be the optimal landscape what is the optimal arrangement of say food plots and cover and uh distances to and from you know what what's the the most effective way to to do that and then when we start adding in um the wind analysis of this so then it would be complicated by what are those movements going to be like when the wind is in their face versus the wind is at their back mm -hmm. um lots of lots of questions we can can keep asking with this and and what it can provide us is um, there's there, there's probably many people listening here that use use apps to try and assess the landscape when they're hunting, and they may have seen things like I think the right word is heat maps here heat maps of of where you might find deer uh, depending on the weather depending maybe on the wind direction these kind of analyses are, are what can inform those figures. So when we're able to add things in, like we know where stands are, we know where food plots are, we know what the weather is, those pictures, those heat maps, they're coming from analyses like these. And when we can get this right, when we actually can get most of the variables in there that we, we know um, are driving the movement, then we can get a really good idea of where we should be hunting. And as, as Natasha alluded to, we, we have, because we know we're going to get some feedback on this and we already have uh, on social media. Yes, we are going to do a very thorough wind analysis and Natasha has already begun, but, but of course it is really complicated and uh, it's going to take a while to completely sort that out and feel very confident in the results. So um, stay tuned. We promise the, wind relative to bedding and wind relative to buck movements is coming. Yeah. I would just as a disclaimer for people um, who, you know, aren't as familiar with uh, statistical analyses and coding as Natasha is, which I'm basically talking to uh, the entire human population. Um, like we love, you know, we all moderate our social media platforms and we all read comments and respond to comments and, you know, we try to be as involved as possible. And we love and welcome uh, and ask for all of the questions and the comments that y'all make on the podcast and on our Facebook posts and Instagram and YouTube videos. Um, 
And a lot of those do have to do with uh, wind direction, you know, wanting to know how wind direction relates to uh, bedding sites, deer movements, how hunting pressure, topography, all those things. And so I don't say this to uh, discourage listeners or our followers from asking these questions because we want them, but I just want to make sure that um, everyone is aware that when you ask for something like this, it's not like we can just sit down and at the snap of our fingers do an analysis. These things take hours upon hours upon hours for me to do them. Natasha can do them much quicker than I can because she's much better at it, but it's still not a fast process. And that is only the running the analysis part. You know, we still got to validate it and make sure that the results make biological sense, make sure that they make statistical sense. So it's, you know, it's a slow process, um, but it's something that is our burden as deer researchers to make sure that when we give you this information, that it's accurate and that we're doing it right. So as much as I would love to just, you know, spit out numbers on Facebook and say, this is how deer move in relation to the wind. We've got some of those data, but we're making sure that they're right before we put them out there for the world to see. That's a really good point. And, and the wind direction is a particular example where it's not just as easy of, as us looking at all the movements and looking at all the wind directions and saying, well, they're always moving in this direction. It's about trying to understand, are they always moving in that direction because that's where their favorite feeder is? Or is it the wind? And it's being able to tease apart all those behaviors and trying to figure out uh, which is really driving the deer's movement uh, or the book's movement in this case. Well, folks, thank you, uh, Mm. Natasha, in particular, for leading this analysis. And and, uh, thanks to all our listeners and Luke and Bronson. And I think we've had about a pretty good time talking about this stuff today. Always. I did. Yeah. I'm really excited about uh, what we've done so far and uh, just ready to keep adding to it. We just keep finding more and more answers. And so it's going to be a lot of fun to continue with this in the future. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We'll do it again soon. All right. See y'all later. (laughs) All right. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. We thank the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation and the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts. We also thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab.